everybody. Uh, let's see, I got some noise going on. All right, welcome everybody. Glad you could make it. And uh, let's see, we're good to go there. Okay, awesome. All right, let's go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. How about that? So I was waiting for you guys in another meeting <laughs> all together, so no wonder nobody was showing up for the class. It's like, okay. So um, <clears throat> let me see here if I can uh, share my screen. And uh, let's do that. All right. Um, there we go. All right. <clears throat> so welcome. Do that and uh, okay, good. So uh, well, I'd like to welcome you all to the this Friday session of Mile Two, uh, along with you guys. And um, <clears throat> topics for the day are going to be uh, for our CSS class, um, the first hour, Chapter Seven and Chapter Eight, which will be accessing the network remotely and social engineering. And then we'll also uh, try to put in a little bit of uh, CVA exam prep in there as well. The second hour, we'll go over the CISSO which will be Chapter 5, covering security models and evaluation criteria, and Chapter 6, which will be on operation security. And we'll do a little subset of that, of each of those, to uh, make it through and get it into the hour. Keep in mind, if you're taking the full-blown courses, um, we would generally have a little bit more time to go over and, uh, and cover the material and so forth. So since we only have an hour to cover two modules, um, it's, we're, we're going to kind of chop it up just a little bit for you guys, but you get the general idea once uh, that all is put together. Okay, um, let's see. Um, my name is uh, Randy Kohler, and I am one of the Mile 2 Senior Security Instructors, uh, and I teach uh, a lot of the courses that Mile 2 has. I've also been involved in the uh, development of uh, some of the courses, like the CPTE uh, courseware and, uh, and such as well as the CVA and, and, uh, and so forth. And if you have seen any of the online, most likely you've heard, you've heard my voice and uh, you say, hey, you know what, it's kind of like one of those guys that's on TV. You know what he looks like, but you just can't figure out what the name of it is, right? And that's kind of what these uh, situations, at least I'll get that every once in a while. They'll say, hey, you sound familiar. I know you from somewhere. It's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those things. <laughs> so anyhow. Let's uh, go ahead and uh, get us going. So uh, I want to make sure you guys can actually see this. So I'm going to pop up here the uh, here we go. We'll pop up the powerpoints here, and you can kind of get a check in on uh, some of that. And here we go. All right. So I'm assuming everybody is seeing now a, a nice big screenshot of the accessing the corporate network remotely. If I could get a yay or a nay from everybody, and then I'll officially get going. So uh, let me know if you're seeing what I'm seeing and hearing me, obviously, with that, hopefully, as well. And hopefully it's coming through nice and clear. All right. Okay, again, welcome, everybody. Glad you're here. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, kind of end this Friday uh, with a blast. All right? Always have to have fun with what you're doing. Otherwise, why do it? Okay, maybe that's <laughs> maybe not the most appropriate thing to say, right, when we're talking about government jobs necessarily. But that's okay. Sometimes they can be definitely fun, and uh, I like to have fun with what I do. So what we're going to do here is look at um, kind of, again, going over the next two chapters here, 7 and 8 on uh, the CSS class. And, uh, again, it's one of those classes that I really enjoy because it covers a lot of the expertise area uh, that I have, which is the social engineering uh, arena and uh, also do a lot of reconnaissance and so forth. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started, all right? All right, let's do it. Okay, so here we're gonna talk about accessing the corporate network remotely. And some of the things here in the overview we're gonna get into are gonna be, uh, you know, how I work from home, how do we do it, what do we do? Um, I know you probably have some users within uh, your environment there that are working from home. How are they doing it? What are they doing? Uh, and, and of course, how could they possibly be infecting the network when they're connected from home? Because those are obviously things that could occur and uh, th that uh, definitely some companies have uh, always have to look out for because they, they have to basically figure out, well, if we have a user that's using a laptop from home, um, 
the, you know, they, they connect to the internet uh, and so forth, and they maybe connect in via a virtual private network, VPN connection inside to the network. And uh, what happens is if they got infected while they were offline, you know, as an off the company's uh, uh, connection, and uh, they got infected, what could happen is once they connect in, that they all of a sudden infect other machines on the network, right? So that could be a big security risk uh, and so forth. So companies have figured out, okay, well, um, working with Microsoft, oops, uh, working with Microsoft and other uh, vendors and so forth, and figuring out, okay, how can we help protect ourselves from that? Obviously, you have the uh, antivirus products and so forth, and your firewalls that help you protect against those types of things. But uh, keep in mind. Uh, that, that just protects it on the local side, and that still can be circumvented one way or the other. Uh, so what vendors have started doing, especially Microsoft, they said, hey, you know what? We have this thing called NAP. Not like taking a nap where you sleep and stuff, but NAP is called Network Access Protection. And uh, what it does is it checks your computer when you connect in, when you put in your credentials, your username and password to log in. It checks that, uh, obviously to see if you're a valid user, and then it will check your machine and do like a health check on it. And it'll say, hey, uh, you need to have at least this uh, version of Internet Explorer. You need to have the latest antivirus product. You need to have this and that. And then if you don't, it won't let you on the network. And thus, we protected our network once more, right? And so those are some of the things that uh, generally will come about uh, when, it, when it comes to issues and so forth when we have home use and so forth. Right? So obviously, you're looking at your home PC from your house to work. Right? We'll look at wireless, hotspots, web access for emails. Uh, also could be a big danger there. And also profile management and VPNs, uh, which will end up with your virtual private networks. So let's take a peek. Now, when we work from home, as I already mentioned, right, most employers allow their users to access the corporate network remotely. That's awesome. That's really cool. That means we can work from home. You know, I actually worked third shift job for six years, and I worked from home. It was great. I didn't have to pay for gas to go in. I didn't have the frustration of being stuck in traffic. It was awesome. Now, the thing was, however, is I did use the computer for other things besides work. Now, that allowed me to possibly get infected, and then if so, again, if the company wouldn't have had NAP, you know, network access protection, uh, I possibly could have, you know, uh, infected some computers inside the network, and then with that maybe caused uh, some havoc to the administrators there. Even though I like to have, uh, again, some fun, but when it comes to having bad fun, that's no good either, right? So this usually includes email access, right, and so forth, and network drives, right? You log in, boof, now all of a sudden you have your H drive, and your H drive is where you save all your files, uh, at least you're supposed to, right? That way when you, something happens to your computer and you're like, oh, man, I can't get it up and running anymore, it's gone, uh, the, help, the help desk or whoever comes up and says, no problem, we'll re-image, they'll use that term, right? Re-image -re your machine. You maybe heard of that before. And, and of course, um, you'll come back as the user saying, oh, wait a minute. Don't just delete everything and redo everything. Uh, can I save my data? And then the help desk should say, well, wait a minute. You have the H drive, right? You know what the H drive was? You're supposed to save all your data there. And <laughs> of course, you know, I was a user before too. Of course you don't save your data all on the H drive or the M drive or whatever it is, um, right? Because you save things on your local computer. Well, the whole purpose of that network drive is to save your data so it can be backed up on the server so they don't have to worry about your computer going down if it gets lost or stolen, or if it breaks where it won't boot up anymore and the data is lost, you don't have to worry about, ah, my data is lost. How do I get it back? Because it's already on the network drive. And that's the whole reasoning for the network drives when you log in from home and also when you're on the network in the office. Right? And that's where that kind of comes into play. Right? So this also could uh, additionally include the user's full desktop. We call this uh, roaming profiles that basically when you log on to one machine to the other, it follows your desktop around all the way and so forth. But anyhow, the more access provided, of course, the more security must be considered. Keep that in mind as you're going out there doing things. Now, on your home PC, again, usually not set up the same security level as your work PC. Some companies will actually go out there and say, hey, uh, here's a laptop. Take it home with you. It's a company-provided laptop. It'll have all those security measures in place and so forth. So you're, in, in a sense, secure right out of the bat. However, it's not always the case. But anyways, when we talk about your home PC, though, here, um, you probably log on as administrator, most likely, as in local admin, right? You probably have no content filtering at home, possibly. Mm, that could be dangerous. Uh, and then also, you already have some viruses or spyware that you're not even aware of. 
right? This is why we always uh, want to make sure we do an antivirus check using malware bytes or whatever your uh, antivirus protection that you use uh, is, all right? So we want to make sure we do this on a regular basis is what it comes down to. So you have a connection to the internet. Obviously, your work has a connection to the internet, but the connection is not secure and your traffic mingles with everyone else's traffic. So what this basically means is that uh, if I have a sniffer installed like Wireshark, it allows me to actually capture all the packets that are currently going on um, in, on the network and so forth. It allows me to actually go in and capture that traffic uh, as I'm going through and so forth. And it's really cool because here, let me, um, let me actually show you some of that. Um, so here, for instance, is a uh, little demo I did a little while ago. But uh, let me take you through iShark here real quick. And as you can see here, I'm running data, and it's currently going through. And, and uh, you can see here the, the, the data is kind of slowly coming in. And then as uh, we're kind of moving through and we're getting data in uh, and so forth, depending on what's being used, what can happen is we can capture username and password information. So if you actually look over here, um, it says right here, request user, mile two, and then here, pass. You see that right there? It says pass. Easy password, one, two, three, four, five. Now that's a really long password, but we still saw it in clear text using a sniffer. And that's generally what happens when you connect in through an insecure channel like the internet. So if you're connecting directly from your house to the, to the uh, uh, server on the network for your office, um, a lot of times we're going to be using what's called a VPN connection, which we'll again mention here in a little bit. And uh, it basically allows us to have security through a tunnel uh, that's created and so forth. Now, other things also that happen, um, a lot of times at home, right, many users have wireless access points in their homes. So when a user uses their wireless access point to access the corporate network, there are also certain risks involved there. Keep in mind, if you're using a wireless at home, you should at least use things like TKIP. We use things like Mac filtering and not broadcasting your SSID and so forth. And uh, basically, it's just uh, different terminologies that are used specifically in the wireless uh, arena that basically keep our uh, keep our things secure. Um, and uh, yeah, so but anyway, as you uh, kind of get into uh, securing your particulars on. Um, your wireless uh, and so forth. Again, there's a bunch of terminology that kind of comes into play. Like your TKIP is your temporal key integrity protocol. And uh, basically it was designed for specifically for the wireless network uh, and so forth. Your MAC filtering, this is basically using the MAC address, uh, the physical address of your network card and um, allowing only that network card to have access to the, to the access point. And your SSID, that's basically the, the name that pops up when you go to your wireless and you're trying to connect to the hotspot or whatever, right? You, you pop that up and it says the name of it and that's what the SSID is. The server set identity is what it is and, uh, and so forth. But anyhow, there's uh, obviously some issues there and, and of course you want to make sure that your router is secured via a username and password. Hopefully not the defaults, meaning, hey, if I see that you are using a Netgear router that's a specific model, I can try to log in with admin and the password of password. And you wouldn't know, you, you wouldn't believe it probably if I told you, but I'm going to tell you anyway, is uh, how many, th there's more times than not where I can get into a device with the u regular username and password that came when you shipped the device, when, when you first got it. It's amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. And you'll be surprised how many like like hotspots are out there like McDonald's and, and, and Starbucks and so forth that actually have those default settings right there. It's crazy. So if you use wireless to access the corporate network from Starbucks or airport hotspot, realize that you have no way of securing your connection. Now, certainly using an access point without permission, freeloading is called, is not acceptable and may also be considered illegal. So be very cautious with that if you're out there doing that. If you are doing it, shh, don't tell anybody because then we don't know about it, right? <laughs> All right, but keep in mind, it could be considered illegal depending on where you are. All right, other things that kind of come into play is web access for email. So here, the majority of the organizations offer some sort of access to email remotely. Now, again, if you are not using Outlook and so forth uh, on the machines and, and when you get home, you log into the network, you may be actually be using um, web access where you go to like OWA dot whatever the company name is dot com and so forth and then you log in with your credentials. Now that um, is something that companies will do as well and uh, and such. 
So majorities of organizations offer some sort of access, as I mentioned. This is also accomplished through any compatible web browser uh, at any random machine. So you can literally go to the library and go online and check it out. Right? Care should be taken when using a machine that is not owned by the employee or the company because, again, you never know. You may be compromised. You just don't know 100% uh, there. Right? We have profile management, which basically means that each system has the ability to remember the settings on a per-user basis. This includes, but not limited to, the website's access, called um, web history, uh, things typed into web forms. Again, these could be uh, done, and of course you always have the option to, to that those, as well as usernames and passwords that you enter. Now be careful when you're actually going out there and using the remember password option, because if the system isn't yours, guess what? Whoever gets back to that page, maybe they're using the website's access portion, looking at the history, they might be able to get in as you because you've saved the credentials. Also, if you happen to own your machine there and you still do the remember the password, keep in mind that someone else could come in and easily uh, see those passwords. Now, I'll give you a real quick sample here. Uh, for instance, let's say uh, we have something like Firefox over here, right? Now, I can go over here to Tools and Options, and I can go over here to Privacy, or actually Security, there it is, uh, and I can look at Saved Passwords. Look at that. And then it'll give me a listing of all the, all the saved passwords in the sites that I went to. And look at here, we have a Show Password option. So then we can actually show the passwords right there. So that's one way to actually see that. Now, there are tools out there that will allow us to actually grab that uh, information if you are storing anything uh, in your browser you know, in your browser settings and such. So be very careful. And plus, what happens after a while is you forget the password, and then you rely upon that <laughs> to get in there, right? And then, of course, whenever you try to change it, some of those settings, you have to know the old password. So then you're kind of stuck, and you're like, oh, I've been there. I've done that. You know, and uh, I, you know, I've been in the industry for since 1996, and there's plenty of times where I've done that, where I just couldn't remember the password, but I had it saved, so that's the way I accessed uh, some of the materials and, and so forth, so some of the websites that I was trying to access. So again, try not to make that a, a crutch for you. So always uh, remember passwords in your head. Don't write them down, and uh, definitely don't uh, use the remember password option when you're out there using your browsers and such, all right? would be my recommendation. Okay, when it comes down to it, uh, the VPNs, your virtual private networks, again, this kind of was uh, what we mentioned here a couple slides back, where when we connect from our home machine to the corporate network, we have what's called a VPN connection. And uh, it's actually pretty straightforward uh, on what happens there and how that all gets uh, kind of put together. And and such, uh, all your Windows boxes will generally uh, allow you to set, set those things up pretty easily. Obviously, the administrators at the office would need to uh, help set up those types of things to have you be able to remote access in to the company and so forth. Keep in mind, it is not a silver bullet, though. Awareness is also still the key that you need to take in consideration when it comes down to it. Okay, so other things um, with that is we uh, help secure things with VPNs. Uh, it uses what's called IPsec or uh, what's called uh, inf um, Internet Protocol Security, and uh, it encrypts the traffic. Now, when we talk about encryption, basically, we're basically saying we're making something that's, that's readable, unreadable. Das wäre jetzt natürlich das Gleiche, wenn ich mit Ihnen ein bisschen Deutsch reden würde. Right? So unless you have a, 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 a decryptor, right, uh, a key, in this case I just used the German language as to encrypt my message, you would have to have somebody else that knew German to be able to decrypt the message back into English. Right? And I basically just said that if I started talking German you wouldn't understand the thing. Right? So that's, that's where that encryption comes in. That's what happens when we connect in from our home machine to the company network and using a VPN. We're basically making sure that the information that comes through kann nicht verstanden werden, yeah? So meaning that, that you can't understand what's going through that tunnel, in this case what we call the VPN connection tunnel. And uh, it all has to do, of course, with IPsec, which helps encrypt our traffic. So even if someone was uh, sniffing the traffic, as we say, uh, using a tool like Wireshark, they would not be able to identify what is actually being transferred to and fro. Pretty cool, right? I think it is, and it's pretty, pretty awesome stuff when it comes down to it. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see. 
Um, let's see, how your system remembers passwords, typed in, what can happen to Starbucks, and how to set up your audit access points, and how VPNs work. So I kind of went through some of those things uh, in regards to remembering passwords section, of course, uh, kind of talked a little bit about what happens when you get to Starbucks. Um, and of course, uh, on your wireless access point, I don't have the ability to kind of show you that at the moment here, but um, when it comes down to your VPNs, I may be able to show you that. Okay, let me show you here real quickly. I, I still have a few moments here for this module anyway, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pop up something here and see if I can try to explain uh, VPNs to you guys to kind of help finish up this particular module. So let's just imagine something. Uh, let's just imagine this here is the internet. Okay, and uh, we'll maybe call it appropriately the internet. Internet, not the intranet. That's something different. All right, let's say that's the internet. Uh, let's say this is uh, your computer. Uh, and let's say this is the server, okay? So, um, actually, let's move this one over here, and uh, let's move this over here, and let's move your computer over here, okay? So this is you, okay? This is a uh, user. Uh, this here is going to be um, the server that we want to connect to, right? So what happens is we get a connection through, right? We want to connect from here, um, oops, we want to connect from, from here to there, right? And that's basically what we want to do. We want to go and uh, we want to connect from a user to your server. Now, if we just ran through, we could have a sniffer then sniff the traffic, right? So what happens is we have a, a wraparound, right, what we call the VPN oops, uh, tunnel. I'll use that one there. Okay. So, and uh, let's do maybe something like that. Okay. So what happens is when we have that VPN tunnel, our traffic right, is encapsulated, what we call encapsulated, so it's protected through that tunnel that's going through, and that's that VPN tunnel. Now, there's different uh, way, there different VPNs that we can use. There's what's called transport mode and tunnel mode, and one is more secure than the other, but they both use, of course, IPsec because it's part of the IPsec protocol. So the VPN connection then gets protected uh, between uh, the user and the server going through the insecure channel of the internet, and that's basically how this kind of comes through. It gets, again, protected in and no one can sniff it. So if someone came in and said, hey, I'm going to sniff this traffic, they won't be able to see anything. Uh, what they may be able to see is, is uh, rather than, you know, this is a test, right, what they're going to actually see is maybe something like this, right? This is what they're, they're something similar that what they will see. They won't be able to identify what's actually going through that uh, tunnel connection. Right? And that's, again, how the benefit is of a VPN connection, how we can get that going. It's pretty straightforward. There's a lot of things to it, obviously, and, uh, and such. But they, you know, in the simplest form, it helps protect our data and encrypts our data uh, so no one understands it and so forth. All right? Okay. And that kind of takes us through the, uh, the, the Module 7 uh, section there, which was accessing the network remotely. And let's take a look into my favorite topic, which is uh, social engineering. So uh, let me find that. There it is. And uh, did we have any questions so far? On uh, let me open this up here. Um, did we have any any questions or, or comments on what we've just covered here? Uh, I'm assuming you guys have remote desktop folks that are working from home and so forth. Have you had anything there to uh, ask or add to that so far? And feel free to either use your microphone or um, use your chat uh, to pop that in and so forth. Okay. All right, so what we'll do here then is we'll go ahead and hop on to the next section. And again, this is on social engineering. Now, uh, again, it should be very short um, in regards to uh, what, what I'll be showing here. And uh, then we'll have a little bit of uh, just a few moments on uh, the uh, Certified Vulnerability Assessor um, exam prep stuff and basically going through the uh, exam prep guide. And it basically just comes down to knowing certain information, which some of the things that we're actually covering here are also going to sort of be in the CVA as well. So let's take a look at one of my favorite topics. And uh, again, this is one of those cool things about um, you know, social engineering uh, and so forth. However, uh, let me check one thing here. I have something uh, like special. I have something really special here. I want to see if I can show it to you guys. Um, let's see. Do I have it right here on me? 
Dun, 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 dun. All right, I don't, but I will have it here in a minute. And uh, basically what we're going to do here is um, yeah, I have a really good um, example of social engineering on how we can go about doing things. Now, however, for this to work properly, I'm going to need your interaction. Okay. Now, we have a few folks here that are uh, actually going through and uh, uh, checking in and so forth. So what I want to do here, let me grab let me grab what I need here. Okay. I'm going to do a little exercise with you guys, okay? Just to kind of give you a good a good thing on uh, when it comes to uh, social engineering. This is uh, really good. When I teach a class, this is usually one of the first things I do with um, you know with with the class, okay? Now, uh, I need you all's participation with this, so I need you to either uh, probably use the chat, okay? Use the chat feature in there, and I need you to respond to me. Uh, for this to work properly, all right? This will be a great demonstration on how social engineering works so you can kind of see the back end of it, all right? So here it goes. Everybody ready? Let's make it happen. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a quick quiz. And on this quiz, I just want you to very, very, it's a very easy, a very easy quiz. And what I want you to do here is I want you to read the sentence out loud in your mind that I'm about to show you. So read the sentence out loud. Do not memorize it. Just read it. Here we go. Okay. All right. Now, remember, do not memorize it or anything. Okay. Now, this is where I need your participation in with, all right? And I need everybody to kind of participate a little bit because... Uh, I'm, I'm predicting there'll be some, uh, some, some. Uh, yeah, well, there'll be some different answers there. Is what I'm, what I'm predicting here. All right. So what I want you to do now is I want you to look at the sentence again, and I want you to count through all of the letter F's, as in Frank, F's that are in that sentence. All right. And then let me know via chat how many letter F's, as in Frank or finished files or whatnot, uh, how many Fs are in that sentence. All right, here we go. Okay, good, good. Keep it coming. Okay, good. Let me get a few more answers here. Got a few already. That's good. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, good. Awesome. I like it. I like it. All right. Now, here's what we got. Now, we've gotten some answers back, and the answers are 2, 3, 5, and 6. 2, 3, 5, and 6. Now, we're all watching the same sentence, right? We're all looking at the same sentence, but we're getting different answers. So let's see how we can maybe uh, kind of expose this a little bit. So hopefully, you found the finished files in Scientific. So those will give you at least three. And hopefully of those three, those were the three you found. Or perhaps, just maybe, you found more. Now some of you had said six. Now there is actually seven Fs in this sentence. And if we look close enough, we should be able to find the other four Fs. And you're probably looking at it and going, wait a minute. No, 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 I only see three. I only see three. Or, oh, I, oh, I see another one. I see four now. Okay, good, good. Five, six, seven. There it is. Finished files of years, of scientific, scientific, of years, and of experts. That is seven Fs in this sentence. Now, the question usually comes across, well, why didn't I see that? You know, I, you, we all looked at the same sentence, and we didn't see all. Um, and this is, uh, again, one of those dangers out there. This is what's commonly known as a scotoma, S-C-O-T-O-M-A, scotoma. It's just Greek for blindness or blind spot. You can Google it if you want. Um, and uh, basically, this is what it is. It's just a blind spot. It's totally natural. This is a natural blind spot. We have these naturally. Um, you know, since uh, most likely you learned how to read phonetically uh, growing up, so of sounds like O-V, and what your brain does is says, wait a minute, I'm looking for F. 
and of sounds like OV, so it creates an automatic blind spot or a scotoma automatically that you don't see it. And then it just you just you look through it and you don't you just don't see the ofs at all. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? And uh, this is what happens naturally. Uh, there's other phenomena like this that happen naturally. Remember the first time you fell in love, right? If it, whoever he or she was, and you could say, man, that person can do no wrong, right? They, they they're just perfect all the way around. And then what happens is weeks later or months later, you're like, wow, that's annoying. Did they do this all along? And sure enough, they did it all along, but you just didn't see it, right? Thus the, the terminology kind of came around that love makes blind, right? Same concept here. It's a scotoma, and it's natural, and that's cool. And that's very important for the social engineer to know about. Now, let me do another exercise. Now, this exercise is very, very tough. It's a lot tougher than the one I just gave you. In fact, it is so tough that if you don't see everything there is to see, then the first 30 seconds of me showing you, you're not going to be able to see it at all for three days. And that's not the worst of it. You're not going to be able to sleep until you see it. So I hope you're listening closely because this next one, it is tough. It is very, very tough. So to help you out, I'm going to tell you a few of the things you might be seeing. That way, you at least see what, I, what I'm going to describe, and then it's just a few other objects that we need to discuss. That, that we need to find, okay? Now, one of the things that are going to be very obvious that you're going to see, it is an arrow, and the arrow is pointing down, and you should be able to recognize that right away. Now, to the right of the arrow, there's what we call a cigar-shaped Indian head with a feather sticking out, and it kind of looks like a little boxy uh, Indian with a feather sticking out of his head, yeah? Now, to the very left of the images is going to be a, uh, an image that looks like, an, uh, like a men's comb, with some teeth broken out of it on the top and the bottom. Some say it looks like a crushed top hat, which I could agree with as well. There are other objects in greater or lesser detail, and I want you to recognize those and tell me what you see. So again, I need your interaction here. You all ready? Let's do it. Okay, does everybody see the arrow pointing down? Everybody see the arrow pointing down? All right, to the right of the arrow, is the cigar-shaped Indian head. You see that there. Looks like a boxy chin and so forth. Now, to the left, as you see there, I've highlighted, there is a comb with some teeth broken out of it or a crushed top hat. Now, the question to you to help you out, what is this third one from the left? What do you think it is? Let me know. What does it look like? All right, very good. It looks like, yeah, it, it could look like that, like a faucet with some teeth, uh, with some teeth, with, with, uh, with some water going through. Yep, that's right. So a water dripping faucet. Horse head. Yep, that could be it as well. Awesome. Yeah, sewing machine. Yeah, could be, could be. All right, cool. All right, let's get this last one out of the way. What is this one? The second one from the left. I don't know if we have any uh, IT folks here in the midst of things, but uh, I usually hear little things like it looks like some vice grips, right? like the old WinZip utility. Dental tooth grip. Yeah, awesome. I would have to research that. that that's cool. Dental tooth grip. That's good. That's good. Yeah, awesome. Okay, cool. Whew. Looks like you're going to be sleeping over the weekend after all, right? Now, let me ask you this, though. Does anybody else see anything else? that we didn't mention yet. Haha. -ha. All right, Eric, very good. Now, Eric says uh, there's a word there, and it's fly, capital F, capital L, capital Y. Yes, and we have uh, another person, MMD, also recognized the fly. Now, hopefully everybody gets to see the fly, because if you don't, it'll be a long weekend, even after the, the long weekend with Monday being a holiday and such, right, or at least for most for some folks. Okay, good, good. I'm glad you see it. I'm glad you see it now. If you don't, let me point it out real quick to you. Now look at the white spaces, the white spaces, not the, not the dark edges that, that we talked about, but look at the white spaces. There's the word fly. So hopefully you see it, and if not, 
well, I guess I'll be hearing from you because you'll still be <laughs> looking for it uh, by the time Monday comes around. All right, very good. So flight. Now this is also a scotoma, all right, and it is a deliberate scotoma. And this is what the knowledge of the social engineers have. They know that they can make you see things that are not there, okay, or, or have you concentrate on things that they want you to concentrate on. So that's really the benefit of being a social engineer is they know how, not necessarily how to do things on the computer side on how to hack into your system or get, oh, well, let me hack into your phone. No, it's more a, I'm going to try to hack in your mind and I'm going to try to trick you in your mind, kind of like a magic trick in a sense, right? Social engineers, they're very, very dangerous, mainly because too, because they don't have to be technically inclined to, to know things. And uh, it, of course, helps when they do. But uh, anyhow, if you guys ever want to see a good social engineering movie, there's a, an old classic called Sneakers, just like the shoes. Sneakers, it's with Robert Redford. Check it out. It's an old classic, and it has lots of social engineering type of uh, scenarios inside of there as well. So pretty cool. All right. All right, let me see if I can wrap, uh, wrap this up a little bit here uh, and get you guys into the uh, CVE here within the next 10 minutes. So um, let's take a peek, social engineering. And again, the, what we kind of just did with that whole scenario is, is something, again, I like to do because I like to point out to students to say, hey, look, we all have blind spots, and some of them are natural, and some of them are deliberate. And with me talking to you guys, saying that, uh, that it was very hard, and, and oh, you're going to lose sleep, I was basically trying to program your brain into, into thinking, uh, you know, like, oh, this is going to be tough, and then causing some type of, uh, uh, you know, just some freeze, all right? Um, as, as a, uh, I apologize for the wording, but as the saying goes, like a brain fart, you know, kind of thing, <laughs> where it's just you won't be able to like, huh, you know? Um, and that's kind of the goal of the social engineer is to be able to basically get information out of you, or if, if it is providing information, giving you kind of, you know, not what, what the actual facts are, but more, you know, what they want you to see and so forth. The salespeople, when you go buy something, like a car or whatever it is you're buying, they're really good at this too because they know this and they try to make you see things that um, they want you to see and then it won't be until after the fact, like especially when you buy like a used car or whatever, and then like a, a couple weeks later you're like, oh, I never noticed that, you know. <laughs> it's scotomas, S-C-O-T-O-M-A-S. All right, there it is. So anyways, uh, we'll take kind of take it through, uh, look at what is social engineering, definitions and terms used, and what is covered. Um, so here again, this, the terminology here, it takes many definitions, but the popular are, it's the art and science of getting people to comply with your wishes. Very nice. And outside hackers' use of uh, psychological tricks to, uh, on legitimate users of a computer system in order to obtain information he needs to gain access to the system. Getting needed information, for example, a password from a person rather than breaking into the system. Pretty straightforward. Example, real quick, too, is when uh, I, if I want to find out your password, uh, I, I actually don't need to know your password. All I need to know is your email address. And I take your email address, and I call in Help Desk, and I say, uh, yep, Help Desk, thank you. Uh, I, I'm locked myself out. And uh, I'll give them the username, which is most likely the email address, or at least the first part. So if it's first initial last name or first name dot last name, whatever, I give them that as my username, and I say I'm locked out. And I might be in front of the web access uh, for the web mail, right? And then they say, okay, well, um, uh, try again. And they said, nope, still can't get in. I said, okay, well, I'm going to give you a temporary password. Use that to log in. And then change your password once you're in. And voila, I'm in. Just as simple as that. It can be that simple. It's, it's really that simple. However, since companies are getting attacked this way, what happens is companies are now changing the way they do things. You wonder. Have you ever wondered why uh, there's uh, warning labels on things and so forth? And you wonder, why do they have a warning label like that on there? Like, you know, don't put... Uh, whatever metal in the, in the microwave or whatever, right? Because somebody out there has done it and has maybe hurt themselves. So someone got sued, like a company, <laughs> and they had to put in implementations of, you know, uh, little signs and uh, warning labels and so forth to help protect themselves, right? So in a sense, they were kind of just saying, hey, well, same thing with the companies. They basically get taken advantage of through social engineering calls and so forth. Then they have to implement new things to make sure that they're protected and they don't get attacked that way anymore. So what companies are doing, instead of using the username, which is going to be on your email address, they make it something completely different, like some random number. 
and then you have to give them the random number to, or whatever that number is assigned to you or whatnot, to be able to log into the system and get your password reset and so forth, right? So those are some of the things that companies are doing out there. Okay, uh, so the definition of social engineering is the technique of circumventing technological and physical security measures by manipulating people to disclose crucial authentication information. The goals, again, to gain unauthorized access to systems, information in order to commit fraud, network intrusion, industrial espionage, identity theft, woo and um, others simply, of course, uh, to, to disrupt the system network. So um, types of social engineering, here again we have physical and uh, psychological. So first we'll fo focus on the physical, and uh, basically this would basically be like uh, the workplace, phone, the trash, yep, it's called, uh, it's called uh, dumpster diving, and then also, also online through the use of emails and phishing, uh, what we call phishing attacks. So again, the phone thing, as I kind of mentioned already, is something that could be used and be very successful with. We have uh, other things, such as dumpster diving, as we mentioned, and uh, this basically allows us to uh, go into the dumpster of the organization and then grab everything that we can. Uh, if the dumpster, for instance, is locked, you have a lock on, you go, ha ha, we're protected, we have a lock with a chain on it, ha ha. Well, great. All I need to do is put my hand in there, put my phone in there, and take some pictures, and hopefully get some good valid information of things that I couldn't grab out there readily because I couldn't jump in. Right? So you've got to make sure you have uh, different layers of protection there to do that because uh, you know, lots of folks, they throw stuff away not realizing the value of the data. Right, the online uh, um, social engineering, again here using uh, your, uh, um, what do you call this, social networking sites like uh, Facebook, Yahoo, and Twitter and so forth. And we can also, go, of course, gain information that way, send you an email, have you reset your password. Next thing you know, we're in as you because you just gave us your username and password. All right, so again, it's called phishing attacks and uh, going through online forms uh, and so forth, which again can be sent by email or through US mail. And uh, again, depends on what you're getting, like a sweepstake type of scenario could also be something that could be affected there. All right, persuasion is also something too. This goes all the way down to impersonation. I like to tell y'all, I come from down south, I'm Alabama, had me some of that sweet tea, and we had a good time. Now, of course, you could also do something like this, or if you like, I can help you troubleshoot your computer. I am very good at it. Thank you very much. Right, whatever it is, uh, as long as we got the lingo down of the organization and we got things going on there, right, we can basically kind of just put integration in, right, we can conformity, right, diffusion of responsibility, friendliness. Hey, uh, that's something I use too. One of the first things I usually say on the phone when I'm doing an attack like this is if someone answers the phone, I say, hey, thanks for coming into work today. And uh, what it does, it catches them off guard and they're like, huh, what? Somebody actually like appreciates me coming into work? What? Right? And what ends up happening is, is uh, they end up, uh, you know, because of that friendliness or whatnot, they, they start uh, feeling like, hey, I, I can tell this person anything, <laughs> you know? And uh, again, you just kind of then ask uh, the appropriate questions to get information they're not supposed to disclose. Pretty cool stuff, right? All comes down to thinking outside the box in a sense. All right, just a few more slides and then we'll hop into the CBA here. All right, so uh, social engineering roles, right? We can come in and do whatever. I mean, you've seen the movies probably. You've seen lots of movies where they do different types of uh, hacking where they dress up and you know go in and so forth. I really love it because I get to kind of dress up in a sense, right? Sometimes depending on situation and I get to pretend I'm someone else. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's like acting kind of thing, right? It's like, I'm an actor, you know? <laughs> but it's kind of fun. Now, the nice thing is, is when the reason why it's fun is because I have written permission to do it. So that way if I get caught by the police and they say, hey, you know, you're a fraudster or whatever, right, they, I, I, I can go to jail. But then I can pull out my authorization slip and say, here, look, I have a get out of, free, uh, get out of jail free card that allows me because we're doing testing, right? We're testing the organization. Here's the authorization letter. It's also, that's what really makes it fun. Now, obviously, I don't do those practical jokes and so forth. Um, I'm a little too old to do that nowadays. But um, again, it's, it, it can be very, very much fun. All right, reverse social engineering as a final, more advanced method of gaining illicit information. It's known as social, uh, reverse social engineering. And this is when the hacker creates a persona that appears to be in a position of authority so that employees will ask him for information rather than the other way around. 
Now, if research planned and executed well, the reverse social engineering attacks may offer the hacker even better chance of obtaining valuable data from the employees. However, this requires a great deal of preparation, research, and pre-hacking to pull it off. And uh, I thought I saw a, a brand new show that came out. Uh, I, I don't watch much TV, but when I do, it's, I come across these shows. And I thought this one was called Mind Games or something like that. It, it had Christian Slater in it, was it? Um, I think it was. And he had a brother, and they were trying to get people and, and it had to do with the mind and, and so forth. And a lot of that was reverse social engineering uh, and so forth. And they were trying to like get this one guy to you know, try whatever. But anyway, uh, you hopefully get the point on where I was going there. I'm sorry, I have to kind of move on a little. Uh, but it, it's, uh, there's lots of uh, Hollywood stuff out there and, and TV shows that will definitely go over a lot of these types of attacks uh, and so forth. It's pretty cool, uh, I think, because, again, it's one of my specialties of, of going out there and doing things like this. Um, and you have to obviously be a people person to be able to do stuff like this. Right? So, again, uh, when it comes down to uh, – as far as covers the physical aspect, so we'll cover the psychological portions, learn how to read someone's hot buttons, uh, and so forth, which uh, we, we won't actually be able to get into here. Um, but basically, uh, if we had like an in class, on like a, you come into the classroom scenario, we're able to actually do some of these types of uh, things where we can, uh, you know, practice with you on how to keep face, right, and and, and minimize actions or outcomes and so forth, give alternate alternatives classify the perceptions and see if they're lying or not, right, which we can't really do too much over the, uh, the internet, you know, using uh, online things like this, but just know that there's a lot to it, facial expressions and, and also the, the pitch of your voice. Uh, you notice that someone's nervous, that hey, their voice will kind of go high up like that, right? Um, but if they're confident, they may have a very confident voice and say, hey, I am the boss here and you're going to do as I tell you to do because I'm, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and so, again, those are just little things um, that we kind of go over and, uh, and you have the opportunity to do. Uh, but keep in mind, though, it's, it's a common everyday things uh, that we need to look out for, too, when it comes to uh, social engineering attacks. Don't hold doors open for someone if your organization requires you to have a badge and you have to use the badge to get into the building. You know, uh, things like that and watching out for things that if you happen to see someone that doesn't wear a badge and you're supposed to wear, approach them. It's okay to approach someone because that actually, when we go audit in, in such companies, you know, we're just walking around the building to see if somebody's going to approach us. And a lot of times they won't because they feel like, well, it's not my place or ah, I don't know, I'm shy, I don't want to. But, but keep in mind that your, your company's your company's on the line or could be on the line and someone could be there that's not supposed to be there and just a simple, uh, excuse me, can I help you, could uh, persuade that social engineer to go away possibly, you know, uh, and so forth and so forth with that. Okay. So hopefully that was very informative and you learned something new there when it came to social engineering, uh, especially with the terming of the uh, uh, scotomas, the blind spots that are both natural and can be uh, put together um, uh, there too. Okay. Now on the um, on the CVA uh, type stuff, and again, this is uh, kind of, uh, and again, I just have a few more moments to kind of cover some of this. But uh, basically what I wanted to do here is just maybe look at, uh, I'm just going to maybe show you one slide on that uh, and then maybe uh, expand upon that. So, um, you know, when, when it comes to the CVA and the CVA exam, cer uh, Certified uh, Vulnerability Assessor, this is basically someone who's going to go out there and do vulnerability assessments for the organization. And, um, uh, you know, the exam is going to be pretty straightforward when it comes down uh, to uh, the things you need to know and so forth and, uh, and whatnot. But uh, keep in mind that uh, as you study through the, the guide and so forth, as, as students study through the guide and uh, take the exam, uh, a lot of times the format is just going to be uh, true-false questions. We're going to have multiple choice, and we get to pick uh, whichever works, you know, whatever the best answer is uh, and so forth with that. And uh, this is just one of the, the modules that we actually cover in the course as well that also gets into, um, you know, obviously some questions that you probably would see on the test. Uh, and so forth. And it basically, you know, comes down to like like here we're mentioning the critical vulnerability types and so forth. And this basically gets into, you know, some of the common terminology that you may or may not have heard of before, depending on what field you're in and, and, and how you're uh, exposed to this day-to-day -day activity. But sometimes you'll hear it on the news and, and so forth as well. Uh, now we have what's called buffer overflows. 
and this is uh, basically going to be caused by a programmer's failure to limit the amount of information that can be written into a predefined buffer. So let's say if I had a, uh, a bag uh, that could only hold uh, eight cans. Let's say I, I go buy some corn. You know, my mom wants me to buy some corn because, you know, we're having, we're having, we're having, we're going to have visitors and we're going to make corn. Rather than buying corn on the cob, we're just getting some cans of corn. So she gives me a bag and I put 10 cans of corn in there because that's all I got room for. So my bag would be the buffer, right? And what I can do is I can actually put more cans in there. Now what happens if I put more cans in a bag that only holds 10 cans is one, it'll kind of overflow, right? And that could cause then, um, you know, some of the cans to fall out and break or whatever the case. So it is with buffer overflows. It causes, let's say, if that application that we're using only is allowing so much to be entered and you enter more than what, it's, what it can hold. And if it has that vulnerability where it's not checking for that, right? We're not checking, we're not limiting it at that. Um, then what happens is it could cause that application to break just like the bag would break or, or the cans would fall out. So, so something would break well, a lot of times. So when we talk about buffer overflows, we're trying to break something. A lot of times it's just going to be an application. Now, uh, we have what's called directory traversal, and this allows a f um, access to files outside the restricted directory structure. Now, let me show you guys something, and do not try this at home, okay? I'm just going to give you kind of the basis of it. But basically what happens is, let's say we, we look for files and uh, online, and let's say I'm looking up, um, I don't know, let's look up, uh, uh, hmm, okay, hmm. <laughs> all right, let's, put, let, let's look up hacking, and I'm going to put something in like uh, file type, oops, uh, file type, colon, PDF. So what I'm doing is, is I'm looking up hacking books uh, that have hacking in it, and as you, and it'll be a PDF file. So all of these will be PDFs, and some of these will have, or mainly all of them will have uh, hacking somewhere in there. So the whole idea of uh, directory traversal allows us to basically go something like this. Let's say I open this up, and um, you notice here it comes up with this PDF document that was readily available, uh, and so forth, right? So what I can do is I can go back into the directory, as you see here, and here it comes back with a, hey, uh, there's a 404 error, meaning page not found. Now, uh, sometimes it'll say forbidden access. So let me see if I can go in here and see if I can get a forbidden access maybe. It comes back with a page not found, which is great. But what we can do is that we can actually take this, and since it's not giving me any more information here, what I can do is I can go back to Google, for instance, and then just pop that in, something like this. But instead, I'm going to put something in like uh, site colon, and uh, take out that and hit enter. And now all of a sudden I have 40 results, 40, from the page not found, which gives us nothing, right? So and this will work the same if it was access denied or forbidden. And then basically the same concept, we pop that in, and now all of a sudden we have access to everything in that directory that's, uh, that the Google search engine will find. Now that's uh, dangerous stuff. Now keep in mind, when we talk about directory traversal, that's what we're trying to, that's what we're talking about, is we have access to resources that we're not supposed to have access to. Um, so there it comes down to configuration issues on the uh, administrative side that are managing these web servers and to say, okay, uh, I have the directory structure, I have it forbidden, nobody can access it. However, if we're able to use different techniques, can we still access the information that's in that directory? And the answer, most times or not, is going to be yes, you can. And uh, as you saw from having just one document that we had access to, to take that out to getting a page not found and not getting any, any additional information, to get 40 documents out of that, that's pretty significant. Now, for that particular example, those may have been all you know, publicly available and, and uh, A-OK, -okay, but just imagine if those are you know, password files, uh, Excel spreadsheets or whatever, or whatever the case, right? Some sensitive files that are for internal use only, right? All I have to do is use Google search and type in internal only, right? And it'll find all those documents that say internal use only, right? And so forth. So it's the idea there of, of doing things. And what's nice about this, this um, you know, finding these things is that you, you can think outside the box, let your creativity go, because somebody out there is probably finding alternate ways on how to do stuff like that, right? And that comes down to directory traversal, for instance. Then we have format string attacks, another common way, an error in, in the way the uh, which the user supplied data is processed. We have default passwords. 
is very, very common. Um, now, uh, when it comes down to some of those, I actually have uh, some, some, let me see, I think I have them right here. Let me check here real quick. I actually have a, uh, some pictures I can show you, at least I think. Give me just a moment. Um, maybe not. Okay, I missed have, must have taken those out. Okay, no problem. Um, but basically, we have uh, different uh, things that, that we can get to get access to and so forth that uh, are default. So we use a admin admin or admin password, things like that. All right, or here in this case, Cisco Cisco. Of course, misconfigurations is also something so more common than not uh, by using the default anonymous credentials for websites, access via FTP, for example, uh, and things like that. And of course, known backdoors. Uh, these are going to take the form of install programs. Uh, and so forth, or may suburb into the system through what we call a rootkit, which basically takes over your operating system and so forth. So questions, uh, something like, you know, a buffer overflow is caused by a programmer's failure to limit the amount of information that can be written to a predefined buffer. Would that be a true or false statement? Right, that would be a true statement uh, and things like that. So as, uh, as uh, questions come through, let me give you a, maybe another question here. What allows access to files outside a restricted directory structure. And then we kind of mentioned this, directory traversal. All right, so as you're kind of going through uh, studying for uh, things like this, uh, just know that the, the questions that are set up in the material that's covered in the class is really, uh, matches up really well. So um, you have the ability to, to uh, again, match things up and uh, figure out the best there when it comes to answering the questions correctly. Just remember, when you're taking, uh, if you're taking the exam on, on things like this, we have uh, basically the format of multiple choice, true-false scenarios, and, uh, you know, obviously best answer versus, you know, choose two out of the four options uh, and things like that. All right? Okay. And that's uh, right on the button there, Sue. So uh, did you guys have any questions in some of the things we've covered so far um, before we take a short five-minute break? And then we'll come back and uh, do the CISSO side of things. We'll spend about uh, a good 55 minutes on that. But uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have right now as well. And uh, feel free to open up your microphone uh, and to let me know or use the chat feature, and then I'll just incorporate that into the session. So feel free to uh, use that. Okay. All right, good. So in this case, uh, again, keep them coming if you have questions. Uh, so far, I've come back with uh, all good, none, uh, and so forth. So uh, either that means I'm explaining it really well, or um, this is all information that's not necessarily new uh, to you uh, and such. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and in the meantime, let's take a, a short break, and we'll come back in five minutes, and then we will um, continue on from there using the CISSO. Uh, and here we're going to get into Chapter 5 and Chapter 6. I'm basically going to roughly break them into a half an hour each, roughly, and uh, we'll cover those two to finish up our Friday session with Mile 2 and the state of Texas. All righty. Welcome back, everybody. Let's go ahead and get a rolling on this thing here. All right. Now, again, uh, for those of you that have come in that are new, my name is Randy Kohler. I'm a Mile 2 instructor, and I am part of their... Uh, team here that has uh, helped develop some of the courses uh, with Mile 2, like the CPTE and the CBA and such, and I'm um, getting involved also with other, like the CPTC and the CISSO as well, and uh, that's what we're actually covering right now. So we're going to look at the uh, CISSO, and in this case, we're looking at module chapter number 5 and chapter number 6. So let's see what we got and uh, see what we can get going here for us. Now remember, too, I wanted to mention this. Um, if you have any questions after we have actually completed the, the Friday session, and then you all have a nice, uh, hopefully, four-day weekend, um, that um, – or actually, three, I guess it would be a three-day weekend, right? For, for those of you that are not here, enjoy your four-day weekend. <laughs> Okay, but anyways, uh, if you have any questions, uh, just remember you can go to the forum, uh, to, to the uh, forum to ask questions, and either myself or one of the other instructors here will be more than happy. Uh, with a smile on our face, we'll be able to uh, you know, ha help you and answer some of those questions you may have there. So it is our pleasure to do so. And no, we're not Chick-fil-A, but it is still our pleasure. <laughs> okay, 
So let's take a peek at uh, some of the things here that goes on in the CISSO class. And uh, basically, I'm just going to give you a little subset of uh, the next two modules here, uh, five and six. And um, basically, one is uh, the security models and evaluation criteria, and then operation security. Now, uh, the CISSO is um, obviously going to be, uh, in a sense, less technical, more technical, depending on the, the environment. We don't get into a whole lot of like things that we talk about in the other courses. But we do get into some other things when it comes to management, implementation, and operations, and so forth, uh, and whatnot. So we'll have a little bit of this. So here, we're going to check out some of the security models and evaluation criteria. Okay, and we're going to basically spend a good hour kind of going over this in the next module. All right, so uh, here I've kind of taken down uh, through the first two items here. Um, which is the trusted computing base and the protection mechanisms that need to be in place for this module. And then we'll hop into the next one here. Now, what it comes down to is what we call the TCB, uh, the trusted computing base. Now here are all mechanisms that provide protection for a system, such as software and firmware, which the firmware is basically something that uh, is part of a hardware component that helps um, interact with the software. And, and we also, uh, on the software side, uh, say drivers and so forth, but the firmware is usually kind of integrated within the hardware itself, so as we call it firmware. Um, anyway, it's uh, hardware components uh, and so forth. We have a, a term originated from the Orange Book, and that these components are highly scrutinized when being evaluated for insurance rating. Right? So the uh, trusted computing base is made up of trusted processes that are executed in privilege mode. And of course, anytime we talk about privilege mode, we're talking about someone with the admin privileges, like administrative privileges type stuff. So good, good stuff. We're able to do some cool things there. All right, security perimeter uh, delineates what is within the TCB and what also processes are not within the TCB. Um, and uh, as as it comes to the you know the hacking world and so forth, uh, you know of course the hackers know about this too. And uh, what they can do is they can of course take advantage of some of this as well. This is why we always want to make sure that we we update things as they come out if we're able to. I understand you may have customized applications within the organization that allows you to stay in an older version of a browser or, or an add-on or whatnot that you're using like Java or Flash or something um, and, uh, and such. But hackers have gotten even more sophisticated and uh, what they're starting to do is they're starting to infect things like the firmware and they're starting to infect things like the drivers which is basically the the, the tool used to uh, communicate from the software to the hardware and so forth. And, uh, and again, we need to make sure that we keep our, our equipment secure physically as well as you know, on the software side uh, and so forth as well. So when it comes to a system protection reference monitor, we basically have uh, what's called a reference monitor, which basically has access control concept that is referred to as an abstract machine that mediates all accesses to objects. Right, it controls relationships between subjects and your objects, and the access control security policy is of a specific system. Right, we have what's called a security uh, kernel. This is where the TCP components that enforce the reference monitor's access rules has a physical implementation for the reference monitor, and the security kernel here is a portion of the TCP B that is that is concerned specifically with a particular access control and so forth. And again, you have uh, different rule sets. For instance, here, the uh, reference monitor might say have some rules for access that says here, you must be a recognized user and must only be granted appropriate level of access uh, and so forth to the resources, uh, in this case, the data uh, object database and so forth. All right, so uh, it, there's always a, a constant flow of how things should go, and that's where all that kind of comes in. Some of the uh, system kernel requirements, some three uh, main requirements that are needed, and one is, is that it must provide isolation for the processes carrying out the reference monitor concept and it must also be tamper proof All right so uh, and again to to do that we need to have of course um, different security measures in place not just on the you know the the hardware side the software side but also on the physical side you know making sure too that when you have a, a server room you're not going to market server room you know, that's great for me if I'm the hacker, I'm coming in and say, oh, there's the server, I'm going to head right over there. Um, and if you've seen some of those movies, I know I kind of reference movies here every, every once in a while, but 
um, moves are great because they actually show us things like, oh yeah, if this lock is unbreakable, how can we break it? Well, just you know, uh, break the wall next to it, or kick the door down, you know, or whatever the case may be, and uh, and so forth. So there's obviously lots of ways to bypass and and, and circumvent things like that. All right, so it must be invoked in every access attempt, and also must be impossible to circumvent. All right, it must also be small enough be able to be tested and verified in a complete and comprehensive manner. And again, this is regarding uh, you know, the, the software side of uh, things and so forth as well. So it's uh, definitely uh, a part of that. Right? So when it comes down to uh, security kernel requirements, remember those three main requirements uh, are there. Let's look at some of the protection mechanisms that are in place that help us uh, kind of keep those things protected right? when it comes to the uh, trust computing uh, side of it. So. All right, so uh, security uh, modes of operation, right? We have what's called the dedicated security mode. This is basically where we have all users have the same level of clearance and a need to know access. It does not, I repeat, it does not require complex methods of controlling access between different classification levels like it is with a lot of military uh, and so forth that we see there possibly. All right, multi-level security mode is another which uh, users have different levels of clearance and need to know. Two or more levels of access based on clearance and classifications must be used, and the data is then possibly split up even into compartments and such. So we have what's called the uh, trusted processes, right, which basically have more privileges. So uh, it comes down to system protection of levels and trust. Now processes, again, here we're talking um, of higher trust can access more system instructions and operate in privilege mode. And uh, again, we need to be uh, cautious on some of those. And uh, obviously we have you know, certain processes here too, as we mentioned there, um, which are going to be running under either local service, in this case network service, or under the username. And then the most uh, highly level one is going to be like your system, uh, so uh, your system account, which basically has higher privileges than your admin accounts, for instance, and so forth. So, Again, when we're talking about privilege level, we're talking about something that's uh, hopefully as the user has full admin privileges and so forth, right, be able to run that in privilege mode. So processes with lower trust can only access a smaller portion of the system instructions and operate in user mode. The CPU architecture dictates the level of trust available and the system resources that can be accessed. And this is mainly going to be like in memory uh, and such. So um, let's see. Uh, the operation system here has to be de developed to work within the architecture. Right, that's also going to be uh, kind of important there. And um, when it comes down to the CPU here actually execute instructions in different states, and all depending upon the requesting process's trust level uh, and so forth. And uh, keep in mind, if you're getting uh, attacked uh, by something, uh, like a virus and so on, um, you know, it all kind of comes down to what is your current level of privilege mode that you're currently in uh, and so forth. And depending on that privilege mode is what that particular virus and worm, whatnot, is going to be uh, going upon uh, and such. And it's going to be worked, worked upon that privilege mode. That's why we want to have users, when they log into their machines, to have least privilege. They only need enough to do their job, not more. Because uh, what ends up happening is when you have more privileges than what you need, sooner or later they're going to abuse it, whether it's maliciously or not. Uh, an example of this, I used to be in the banking industry a long time ago. Now the bank that I worked for is no longer in existence. They got bought out by a bigger bank. But what happened was uh, I had, uh, you know, there was a, uh, the owner of the bank uh, was in my, my location. And uh, I used to go to, to these meetings and so forth as an information security officer there. That's what got me into this whole security field anyhow. But needless to say, um, he kept boasting about $50 million this, $50 million that. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to check it out. And I checked out his account and uh, because I had access. you know, And it wasn't anything malicious. I just wanted to be like, hey, I just want to see if this guy really like have $50 million in the bank. That's just ridiculous. And come to find out he didn't. Um, and uh, I basically call them on it in a sense. But then uh, shortly thereafter, I got a phone call from another office that said, hey, uh, how's it going? Um, I'm like, okay, good. You, they're like, uh, yeah, we just got a report that uh, you were checking out the owner's uh, bank account. 
I'm like, oh, <laughs> instant sweat, <laughs> you know. Uh, and uh, I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, well, and, uh, 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 and tried to explain the situation, and they basically said, hey, it's fine, no problem, just don't do it again, right? It happens. But again, when you have that privilege moment, when you have those permissions that are, that are more than what you need, again, sooner or later, either deliberately or not, you may have just abused those accidentally, like I did. <laughs> you know, but it happens. It, it just uh, it just happens, and, uh, and and such. But anyhow, so again, here we have user mode, which is basically less trusted, and privilege mode, which is also called supervisory mode, which is going to have the most trusted. Other things we can do here too in the system protection is to do process isolation. And here's where we preserve the object's integrity by enforcing access rules for subjects. Right? It controls how those subjects and those objects interact with each other. It ensures that they do not corrupt each other's data or structure overall, right? Because it needs to make sure that it does not do that. The shared resources, however, must be properly controlled through complex access controls. And uh, again, this might be done in the in, in the ways of uh, groups and, and and such, and of course different permission levels for those and and so forth. So um, actions of one object should not affect the state of another object, and the techniques here used to enforce isolation could be encapsulation of objects, time multiplexing of shared resources possibly, naming distinctions maybe, and even things called virtual mapping possibly. And uh, just to kind of give you a little uh, scenario there on the on the technical side, I guess there's actually something really cool coming out there, and uh, it's basically and let me see if I can bring it up here for you. It's a, a nice little um, spiel here, and it's called uh, sandboxy, and it kind of uh, is real nice because it gives us a good idea of uh, this whole isolation and keeping things. Uh, kind of different. So if we look over here, um, it, it basically kind of separates and puts what's called sandboxing, uh, our, our memory allocation, at least in this case, and how it's used in the hard drive and so forth. But we can do the same with the processes uh, and so forth as well. But it just kind of shows you it just separates itself from the main, and uh, with that you're able to help protect that, again, using the uh, what we call the process isolation. Right? So it's somewhat pretty straightforward uh, and, and so forth when it comes down to it. Now, obviously, here when it comes down to system protection, we need to look into layering, which uh, a lot of times we'll refer to this as the defense in depth. And uh, when it comes to the layering side of it, we basically look at other things, and, and I'll have a slide on this here uh, as well. But we basically need to look at um, system protection uh, as in with protection rings uh, and so forth. And, and I'll mention it here again when we actually see it, so I can kind of maybe explain that a little bit more. But uh, layers can, of course, be divided by functionality or security. And since processes operate in different layers within the system and must communicate through interfaces and so forth, right? So again, we can divide those functionalities um, um, for security and such, right? We can protect critical processes from possibly less trusted ones. Uh, we have independent modules um, with, uh, which only communicate with each other when it is necessary to fulfill a specific function that we may have uh, and such. And of course, data and processes can also be hidden uh, from each other for protection as well. And again, this is just, uh, just an additional layer of layering, as we, as we say. Now, on the uh, application programming interface, also known as the API, uh, right? It has calls, software interrupts, and subroutines that are outlined in the document's interface. It allows, in this case, also a higher level application to use operating system services or those of another application and such. And uh, basically here, um, as we're mentioning, is a good API also makes it easier to develop a program by providing all the building blocks. And the programmer here basically puts those blocks together where most operating environments, uh, such as your Windows, uh, and such provide an API that programmers can write application consistent with the operating system environment. Now, although your APIs are designed for programmers, they are ultimately good for users as well because they guarantee that all the programs using a common API will have similar interfaces. This makes it also easier to learn for the users when it comes to new programs and so forth. Routine is going to be basically a section of the program that performs a particular task. And uh, programs consist of modules 
each contains one or more routines. The term routine is uh, synonymous with procedure, function, and subroutine and such. All right, there's also um, different types of network communication APIs and so forth, like your remote procedure calls and your uh, message APIs. We have what's called the IBM APPC, your Advanced Program to Program Communication Model, which is conversal, um, conversational that is, and RPC models have also been deployed by Sun Microsystems and by the Open Software Foundation and also by Microsoft in the Windows environment uh, and so forth as well. Okay, okay again, allows us uh, critical processes, generally do not provide APIs to less trusted processes, which obviously is a good thing. And then we have allowing the application to access, such as network components, protocol stacks, drivers, services and peripherals, file systems, databases, and, and other items uh, as well when it comes uh, down to these API characteristics and such. So to get you to do what I was mentioning here about the uh, system protection and protection rings, uh, and these basically uh, protection rings separate processes at different trust levels and the rings are provided by the CPU's architecture, and the operating system can be written to use all or some of the rings, and, uh, and so forth. And a lot of times when we talk about what we call the defense in depth, we'll bring this up and we'll, we'll kind of uh, add to it and, and uh, give you kind of more the, uh, the outline where, you know, like here with the rings, this is obviously going to be with the operating system kernel, right, uh, which generally is not going to be accessed by the software itself, right, uh, the operating system. Um, so we wouldn't be able to access the kernel, at least not on a Windows system. Now on a Linux system, Linux Linux system, uh, we, we should be able to access uh, that and uh, have access to that. Now the operating system obviously is going to be a separate ring, and the operating system utilities will also be uh, a little different than we had prior. Um, and uh, of course, with, with the separation, we have different levels of trust, and um, obviously the most protected one has to be the kernel. If we have access to the kernel, uh, such as a rootkit might have, then that means we can make modifications to uh, the operating system even, because again, it's the most trusted, right? So we have the operating system kernel. If that gets compromised, then uh, we could compromise all of the other rings as well. Now we can basically go from the inside out, but when it comes from the outside in, it's a lot harder to do. Uh, obviously there are ways to go about doing that, and there are specific tools that will take advantage of that, um, but there's also tools for us that we can check to see if we are actually uh, under, you know, if we're actually protected and so forth. So for instance, oops, uh, I have the run command here. I can type in something like sig uh, verif, for instance. And this will take us to what we call the file signature verification tool. And what this will do is once we start it, it's going to go out there and it's going to verify our files to make sure that they're digitally signed. Because a lot of times when uh, we get infected with a rootkit and such, it will take over, again, one of those rings, and it's trying to get to, to that um, kernel, right? So once it's gone to the kernel, it can pretty much do whatever and um, it can hide itself anywhere without really being affected um, of reboots and so forth. So uh, here, as you can see, the signature verification tool comes back and tells me that all my files have been scanned and verified, uh, as in digitally verified, so no changes have been made to my operating system files uh, and so forth, right, which could indicate possibly a rootkit. Now there is another tool that we could use, and uh, here, for instance, uh, there's a cool uh, tool called the SFC tool, and um, basically it's a file integrity checking tool that will go out there and actually check my files, and it will scan for the integrity of those protected system files and then replace them with the correct version of, my, of Windows files. And um, basically it's the same concept here. You type in SFC and you use the scan now option, and then it'll go out there and it'll scan the system and of course make those changes as needed and so forth. And it may take a while to go through that process, but these are some, again, some, some nice built-in tools that come with Microsoft Windows that um, you could use to help verify uh, some of these, uh, you know, protection rings are actually, you know, in effect and whatnot. So um, a lot of times, again, as I mentioned, we have uh, different uh, Trojans, uh, viruses, and rootkits that will try to get into those additional rings. And uh, as I mentioned with the defense in depth, scenario, 
it basically comes down to, you know, as with anything else, you've probably seen the movie Shrek, right? And uh, how he mentions in the movie, like he's an onion, right? It has multiple layers uh, and so forth. And so it is too when we think about securing our network, when we think about securing our operating systems and so forth, our buildings and whatnot, we have to have a layers, layers of security. We don't just say, okay, we have a $500,000 firewall, we are protected. No, but that $500,000 firewall might be, you know, circumvented by just walking into the front door, right? Because all of a sudden I bypassed your firewall just like that. And uh, so you got to have to look at, again, in uh, those different rings, uh, or in this case, uh, different layers and, uh, and so forth. So let's say on the outer layers would be uh, something like uh, your policies and procedures and uh, things like... Um, Oh, policy procedure, user awareness training and things like that, right? And then you maybe have a layer underneath that that's, that's your physical layer maybe where you have locked doors and maybe fences with barbed wire on it or something to that effect, right? Then you have your, out, your perimeter on the outside where your firewalls maybe come into play. Then maybe inside of that your internal, uh, like your intrusion detection systems, right, is another layer. Um, you may have intrusion prevention systems, things like that. Um, then you get into the operating system itself, right? Which uh, basically you have to keep it patched and up to date, and uh, and so forth. Patch uh, all the patches and the service packs and so forth. And then you have to look at the applications that are on top of the operating system. Get those, like your word processors, web browsers, whatever, right? Those all need to be up to date and patched. Your Java's and so on, right? And then of course you have the data itself, which then goes into protecting it through the term of uh, encrypting like the hard drive and then of course setting permissions onto the files and folders and uh, and password protecting it possibly and things like that uh, right so as you can see it's a multi-layered approach that you would use to protect it same as we're seeing here with our multi-ring approach on the system protection and protecting those rings uh, and such and that's where all that kind of comes into play all right so what does it mean to be in a specific ring well keep in mind that the barriers between components of different trust levels. So we have different trust levels that are based off of that. Now we have uh, other things like uh, requiring them to communicate through strict interfaces. So when the processes execute, they do so in a security context, user mode or privilege mode, and depending on which ring that process executes within. Right, processes can also access uh, resources in the same or lower ring only, and the processes here with the higher trust level will generally have a larger domain of system resources available to them as well, and that should pretty much be self-explanatory on that end, right? And that's uh, kind of just a little subset stuff of uh, our Module 5 uh, of there. Obviously, it gets into other things like security models, evaluation criteria that still would be uh, needing to be done in that module, but you get the idea of uh, what we're looking at here. Okay, so we're right on time here where we need to be. So in the next uh, 25 minutes or so, um, we're going to go ahead and cover um, the Module 6 side. And uh, what I've done here is uh, I'm going to uh, cover roughly 23 slides, and um, it's going to cover operational, or operations uh, security, that is. Not operational, but operations security and, uh, and such. And then we'll look at um, basically operational uh, issues and responses, and then look at threats uh, to the operation, which will kind of go over a f some of the items we've mentioned uh, before and such as well. Again, you may relate to a lot of this as we go through because, again, you may be working in an office where you come across these types of uh, things, terminologies, and so forth. So let's take a peek at what we got. So this is the operational issues and responses section. So when it comes down, what are we doing uh, to protect ourselves and so forth, right? So we're basically going into um, the... Uh, what we call the facsimile security, as in your fax uh, modem, right? Your faxes uh, and so forth, and how we actually uh, protect those in uh, and so forth. So your fax machine security issues, you may think there might not be any, but there actually are a few issues there that comes with that. It may be used to transfer sensitive data, possibly, and uh, depending on where it is, again, depending on what's what's capable of doing. If you have one of those uh, fax machines that allows you to do PDFs and send you an email, uh, even better. Right, um, but needs to say here, uh, maybe use transfer sensitive data. Paper sits in the bin for all to see. Printing a banner or cover sheet may not provide enough protection. Right, so you got to make sure that you're securing your shelf when it comes to those uh, facts change and uh, 
not just make them available just to anybody, but only to the people that need it. Yeah. Or on the fax servers, these are going to be, uh, they can route uh, faxes to emails boxes instead of printing. They can also disable printing features as well. And the fax encryptor encrypts bulk data at the data link layer, which uh, when we say things like data link layer, we're talking about what's called the OSI model. I won't get into it too extensively here, but the OSI model consists of seven layers, and this would be layer two of those seven layers. Uh, also, it provides extensive logging and auditing that you could use to help protect yourself when it comes down to that. Other things to consider when it comes down to it, especially again, we're just talking about faxes, is looking at email security. Uh, and again, here there's a possibility here of doing different things, such as email spamming. You may have been a, a victim of this in the past or whatnot, where it comes down to um, get an email from someone you know, and you look, and then that email was sent out to possibly, you know, everybody in your in your list, in your contact list, and so forth. Um, so uh, you may have uh, done some kind of email spamming, either deliberately or not deliberately. Deliberately meaning, in this case, um, like. Um, you sending out a joke to everybody, right? That sometimes could be considered email spamming, uh, especially if you're using company email for that uh, and such. But okay, we have what's called email PGP, as in email pretty good privacy. And this assists us with helping keep our email secure um, and allowing it to you know, be uh, somewhat encrypted on the way out and so forth. Now, it generally requires that other people have to have this uh, installed as well for it to work properly, but let's you know, say that it's, it's uh, another way to help, help secure ourselves. Now, we have a POP and IMAP, um, which basically are going to be used for the uh, email side of things when it comes to receiving emails uh, and so forth, and uh, those also need to be protected. Because what could happen is if you don't protect them, even if you do, uh, let me give you a little sample here on uh, on something. There, the, the hackers out there, they basically will use, um, you know, all kinds of all kinds of things. Uh, so, for instance, here I'm going to be using this little tool, and it's called Cane Enable. And what they can do is uh, they can manipulate the network that you're on so much that when you are, let's say, presented with this, let's say you're going to work every day, right? And every day everything's cool, and then one day you get this. And it says, there's a problem with this website security certificate. And you go, okay, what's this all about? Well, I need to get to my emails, or I need to get to Facebook, or wherever, right? And then what you do is you say, okay, continue to website, not recommend it. When you do that, because of the tool that we're using, this hacker tool, uh, we're able to give you a what we call a fake certificate, which then allows us to capture all the traffic that goes to the secure secure server that you're going to to get your emails or to log into Facebook or whatever, we're now getting it through the hacker machine uh, in clear text, meaning we're able to see everything that you're typing in and so forth, like your username and password, and uh, we then get to encrypt it on the way out to the server, and we call this whole process the man-in-the-middle attack. And actually, this is uh, kind of what's happening here. And as I'm going through, I actually have things secured and the way we know that things are secure is uh, right here. If you notice, um, we basically have uh, what we call the port numbers. And these port numbers are going to be related to certain services that we run. So 443, for instance, runs service of SSL, or Secure Socket Layer. This is basically when you go to a website and it has HTTPS and it has a little lock on it, that's SSL part. You know, that's how SSL kind of is. So it runs on port 443. Now POP, as you can see here, POP there, um, it runs on normally on port 110. Now here it's running on port 995. Now 995 for POP is actually secure. And you notice over here it says uh, POP 3S, right? That means that it's secure POP. That means that it should be encrypted, right? But watch this. As I'm going through and we're using things, look at that. I look at my POP and sure enough, I am able to see all of my usernames and all of the passwords for those usernames. It's crazy, but this is what happens when we talk about what's called a man-in-the-middle attack and so forth. And that's basically some of the things that could happen if you're, you know, when it comes to POP and IMAP, is that it, it will capture this data as it's going through and then expose it to the attacker. That's crazy, but it's kind of cool for the attacker, and it's kind of cool when I'm out there doing an audit, 
because we're like, hey, look at this. We got some good stuff, right? And then also we have the ability uh, to do e email relaying. And this basically means that we can send an email from the target's web, uh, uh, web mail server. So if, if I was to attack your mail server in Texas there, and I was wanting to send out maybe 1,000 emails or 100,000 emails, I would use your server to do it after I've compromised it. Now, the reason I would compromise is because most likely, as with most companies, is, is what we call the email relay. The mail relay was in conf uh, configured incorrectly, or it was basically just turned on, which you don't necessarily need it. When, it, when it's turned on and it's not configured correctly, what happens is we can do email relaying, meaning I can send emails from somebody else. Uh, in this case, it would be your server that we would send it from. So when, it, when the uh, emails then arrive to the destinations, when they look at where did this come from, they'll actually say, oh, this actually came from the uh, you know, Texas mail server or whatever the case there. All right? And that's where that kind of comes into play. All right, pretty cool. Okay. Moving right along, uh, here we have a vulnerability assessment guidelines. Uh, here, look at the, the goals of the assessment uh, and such. Evaluates the security posture of the environment. It also goes through and in identifies as many vulnerabilities as possible. And uh, again, with the vulnerabilities, these are just going to be uh, uh, like weaknesses within the uh, application of the operating system that could be exploited and attacked um, successfully to then allow someone to have remote access to that system with full privileges uh, and such a lot of times. So um, it also allows you to test how systems react to certain circumstances and attacks. They generally have a written agreement for management, which includes a scope, the risk of testing, and then of course vulnerable systems could be knocked offline, possibly. Pro uh, production could also be negatively affected, meaning that uh, you know, we could have downtime and such. And results from the test are just a snapshot of time so uh, keep in mind it may or may not be good results depending on that snapshot that it was taken uh, and such. Right, the types of assessments that we basically have available, we have personal, uh, like your social engineering and employee policies and procedures. We have physical, which would be like facility and perimeter protection mechanisms, interior protection mechanisms, protections of server rooms, wiring closets, and so forth. And again, these could be uh, everything from uh, you know locks and so forth to deterring methods like uh, cam security cameras and, uh, and, and security guards uh, and things like that. Right, of course, dumpster diving, which could be fun, uh, and going in there and going in the trash and such. Um, a protection mechanisms for man-made, natural, and technical threats, uh, everything from bollards, uh, which are basically just concrete poles, uh, that could assist with helping protect uh, uh, that or, or whatever the case may be for natural disaster type stuff uh, and so forth that you may put in place. Right? System and network, of course, automated scanning uh, products are available, which uh, also allows us to identify system vulnerabilities very, very easily, and we can go out there and do some cool stuff there. All right. Now, I would usually spend a whole lot of time on this, but um, I'm just going to kind of leave it at, at the bare minimum here because I do have a few more slides that I need to cover here. Um, and whatnot, but let's take a peek here. So uh, this is basically called the five phases of hacking, uh, what the hacker will go through. And uh, basically goes through step one, which is reconnaissance. This is basically where we gather as much information as possible about our target, and uh, we literally talk about whatever information possible. So if it means uh, accessing your Facebook account to get additional information because you're the CEO of the company and we need to find out you know, uh, if your employees are sharing stuff or whatever, and, and whatever the case may be there. There's lots of different ways to go about it, but it comes down to uh, the way I look at reconnaissance. It's a way to um, put a picture together, like if you're putting a puzzle together, and you're finding pieces of the puzzle. The more pieces, the bigger the picture. And that's what we're trying to do is get a big picture of what our target is. Once we have that, then we can go through the scanning phase which uh, we basically go through and we scan the network of the IPs that we found, the IP addresses of our targets, and then we figure out what ports are open and such. And remember, I mentioned the ports identify a particular service. Depending on the service, we can attack different ways. So we basically figure that out and then say, okay, we have a server that has port 53 open, which is DNS, which means we can do a DNS zone transfer, which means we can grab all of the information that that DNS server has and bring it over to us. Uh, and we, we can then expose information that wasn't 
meant to be exposed. We also have gaining access, also known as enumeration, where we exploit uh, some of those things and gain additional information about the remote target uh, in our the computer or whatnot. So we will find out users and groups that are on that computer. We'll find out if there's any lockout accounts uh, or you know, if any of them are, are set to lock out after so many failed logon attempts and things like that, which could assist us in gaining, again, more access to the system. Once we're in, we can, of course, then have to maintain access, and we basically do this by uh, installing what we call backdoors, uh, Trojan horse, uh, things like that, root kits and such, and then, of course, we then get into the covering of our tracks, which, again, with the computer systems uh, and so forth, it generally will track everything that's being done. I mean, literally everything that's user click, check, click, click this resource or whatever, right? Everything gets generally logged uh, and so forth. So to be able to go out there and cover our tracks by deleting those logs is pretty awesome. Of course, you need certain tools, certain conditions for that to happen. And that's why we always recommend that when you ha are doing some type of logging, that you want to have um, the ability to uh, go out there and, and uh, watch those logs uh, and make sure that everything is well as you're uh, going you know, through those and so forth. So anyhow, that's kind of the five phases. We get into a lot more of that uh, when you take some of the other courses like the CPTE or the CPEH course. Uh, we, we cover a lot more of that and get you to do some hands-on stuff and so forth with that. Okay, penetration testing. Now, uh, when it comes to uh, penetration testing, this is basically uh, after we've done our vulnerability assessment, we figure out what systems are vulnerable we actually penetrate them, as in we try to break in, in a sense, right? Uh, we have things like passive reconnaissance, which is also known as footprinting and sniffing through tools like Wireshark and such, where we can see the traffic that goes on. We can perform active reconnaissance, such as scanning systems, map the network, and enumerate resources and accounts, and so forth. So this is going to be more actively touching the target. Making phone calls and things like that would also be active reconnaissance. Right? Exploit, identify vulnerabilities. So whatever we find, again, on the vulnerability sets, we try to exploit those. And, uh, and again, the terminology we use is called we, we pen test the box, basically. All right, we exploit the, the vulnerabilities. So operating system application attacks, we do elevation of privileges, possibly. We maybe even go in and configure a re-entry point through a back door, or we install a root kit that will then also be able to capture keystrokes and video and sound and all kinds of stuff. It's kind of crazy on the stuff you can do there. All right, so we have called ethical hacking. The goal here is to carry out activities as the enemy would, so usually using the same tool set of most of the hackers out there. Uh, and that identifies vulnerabilities and exploits them. The only way to gauge if the vulnerability is real and to what degree. This means you have to go in and, and test it out, make sure it works. Uh, and things, right? So those are going to be part of the, the scenario there or when it comes down to that. Uh, carries out also many activities such as password capturing and cracking. We have what's called ward dialing, which is basically driving, well, it's ward dialing has to do with modems and, uh, and such. So if your company has lots of modem, modems and that's maybe what you're doing your, your phone system through and so forth, uh, then we could do ward dialing, which will find those modems and then try to gain access to your network through that. Or we have what's called ward, uh, ward driving, which is basically uh, driving around in a car and looking for um, what we call uh, wireless access points or your hotspots or whatever there, right? And uh, it's actually pretty cool if you uh, pick the right tools. Uh, it can be quite fun. Um, and um, I actually have uh, something here I'm going to show you. And basically, these are some of the tools you can use for that. And uh, to go around, and this is what the hackers are doing, is they're driving around and uh, they are basically capturing the uh, access points and so forth. This is the one I kind of like the most called Wi-Fi Inspector and uh, I have a lot of kids so what I do sometimes I in my, put them all in the van I say, hey, let's go, we're going to pretend we're in the Navy. They're like, what? In the Navy? It's like, yeah, we're going to go on a submarine. They're like, oh, cool. So we go in there and I basically uh, make sure all the windows are kind of, you know, where it's all dark and stuff and then I'll get my laptop up and then I'll basically bring this up as we go when we war drive, and it'll look something like like uh, like this here. And I say, okay, what are we saying, right? And we go around, we make it fun. And what that does for me, anyhow, is it it allows my my kids to range uh, from four to sixteen. It gives them excitement about technology and about, in this case, uh, computer security assessment. Uh, and so
so forth and doing possibly down the road, maybe doing pen testing. Not to become the hacker, because the hacker will already know this anyway, but to become more on the good side of things, right, and do, do things like that. And again, when you have tools like this that make war driving fun, and other tools that make pen testing fun, why not, right? You love doing stuff that, yeah, I know you know. You know you love doing stuff that you like doing, right? And time goes by really quickly. Like, I can't believe it's almost time for me to call this a day for you guys because we're just having so much fun. At least, you know, I am. <laughs> Hopefully you are too, and I'm not making it too hard on you guys. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just fun. This is uh, really exciting stuff, and uh, it's pretty awesome that you – you know, get to ex be exposed to, to some of that too. So anyway, war driving, finding access points. Um, of course, we have the hack and attack strategies. Uh, again, kind of goes through what we call the attack tools uh, and so forth that will be used. We have what's called script kitties. Now, these are going to be the folks, let's say if I told my mom, hey, mom, uh, can you download this tool and just click a button and take it to this website and click another button or whatever? Uh, she would be considered a script kitty. Right? She would be using a tool, maybe even causing tremendous amount of damage to the target with this simple little tool. But she doesn't know what she's doing. She's just kind of funneling along my directions or whatever and just saying, oh, okay. And she would be considered a script kitty. All right? uh, we also have uh, d different things like don't fragment attacks. Uh, we have where we don't rely exclusively on high-tech tools uh, and such. Right? Stealth methods might be used uh, and so forth that as we go out there. Same thing when we do scanning or even the reconnaissance and so forth. We do a lot of those things. Right? We might have back doors that assist us in grabbing information and, and, and secretly emailing it to us uh, and such. Right? Uh, possibly not to uh, damage system or data. Right? And don't overlook small weaknesses and search for bigger ones. And of course, have a toolkit of techniques. And uh, again, what I usually like to refer is uh, the term of think outside the box. Okay, we learn things a certain way, um, you know, just like we learned how to read phonetically, right? But what it ended up doing, because we learned in that box, when we looked at something where I said, hey, find all of the letter Fs, you were looking at it from within the box. And uh, sometimes you need to step outside of that box. And I know, I know, I'm sorry, it may be almost impossible for some folks to step outside the box, and that's totally normal. Right? It's okay. There are some people, like myself, who were, in a sense, born outside of the box. It's like, I don't know how to get into the box. <laughs> you know? So, um, But, th th again, uh, thinking outside the box will definitely help uh, a lot of times. Um, but it is okay to be in the box, too, okay? Um, and if you're uh, in the box, it's cool. It's totally fine. Keep in mind, you're, you're, you shouldn't have the sole responsibility of keeping things secure in your environment and so forth. This is where we have a team of people, and then hopefully within the team we have a, a few folks that think outside the box uh, and so forth. And that's where, again, that all kind of comes in. We're not, you know, lone rangers, even though I know for us guys out there we like to pretend we are, but in reality we're really not. Uh, we're, we, we're far better in a team environment. We're far better when we work together with others. Um, you know, if I dig myself into a hole by myself, I'm not going to be, be able to get out of it. Right, so I, I generally will need somebody to help me get out of that hole, um, and and so forth. So it's it's when we do pen tests and when we do these audits, uh, audits and so forth, and we try to secure companies, uh, we try to make them, uh, not make them, but we try to let them see different ways of seeing things, uh, just like like we saw with the F cards, right? We we look at a different light, we're able to see things like with the fly card, right? We're able to see different things from different points of views, and uh, a lot of times that's all it takes to really. Uh, take that, take it up a notch, as we say, to help secure our environments and secure our our overall, you know, uh, keep keep us secure. When it comes down to it, there it is. Okay, uh, then it also has um, what we call the protection mechanisms. Uh, in this case, also honey pots uh, and so forth. And uh, this is basically uh, where we have what we call the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. Uh, and so forth, right? And a lot of times it's con considered the sacrificial lamb system on the network. And uh, the goal here is that the hackers will attack the system instead of the actual production systems and so forth. And uh, it, it's kind of uh, just like Winnie the Pooh uh, type of scenario with the honeypot, right? Um, it's, it's nice and sticky, so once the attacker goes in and starts, you know, basically trying, oh, I hacked the machine, oh, I'm going deeper into the network, and ha, ha, ha. Um, what they do is they preoccupy themselves on 
you know, the, the fake environment in a sense, that, uh, which also gets recorded, by the way, where everything gets recorded on the, uh, on the honeypot or the honey net if, we, if we're simulating a network, um, that we can then identify what the hackers are doing, how they're doing it, so we can then also make better products to help secure our systems and so forth and our processes and such that we use. Again, it's, it's a, a matter of trial and error sometimes. Um, keep in mind, n you know, if things came out perfectly the first time around, we would never need upgrades, right? We would never need another, oh, there's a service pack coming out. <laughs> well, there's a new operating system coming out that's supposed to be more secure, Oop, uh, you know, and so forth. Um, it's, I, I talked about locks last week um, with physical locks, like padlocks and so forth, and you know, even there we can we can do a lock picking on those. We can we can do what's called shimming on those by we're using a soda can, for instance, uh, and such. And check out the uh, the archive uh, on on that from last week, and you get to see some of that and where I was explaining uh, that and and such. But I need to say what I was just trying to go with this is that uh, things will always have to be upgraded. We may be you know uh, there may be very smart individuals out there that come up with tools and come up with processes of ways to help protect things or, or, or and so forth, but there's always somebody out there, uh, especially if someone says, our product is 100% secure, right? And there's somebody out there, maybe even in, in somewhere in Alabama in the neck of the woods there, uh, saying, oh, he said that uh, it's 100% secure. Well, I'm going to go uh, try it out. And next thing you know, they come up with a, <laughs> you know, with some type of uh, exploit tool or some type of tool physically that they can then bypass that 100% secure environment. So, right? so just know the best way to help secure that is multiple layers, right? That take that multi-layered approach, just like Shrek, just take off one layer at a time. In this case, we're adding on one layer at a time to keep us more and more secure. Just like you have uh, your rope, right? If you take three strands and you strand them together, right? you braid them together, you have a far stronger rope than if you had them individually, right? And that's what we're doing when we're uh, providing these extra layers of security from encryption of the hard drives to password protecting or, 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 or setting up uh, permissions for certain users on files and folders and so forth to antivirus products and intrusion detection systems to patching of our applications uh, like the Java's and the, and the Flash and so forth and uh, also from the operating system keeping that up to date and then getting uh, intrusion uh, detection and prevention systems and firewalls and then physical security and then your policies and procedures and the, uh, the awareness training it's a combination of all of that that helps us stay more secure rather than just the simple, as we mentioned earlier, hey, I have a $500,000 firewall, I'm secure. Okay, so hopefully, uh, I know I've, I've beaten the dead horse there a little bit, but hopefully that will kind of uh, rain down a little bit and, and make more sense uh, as time goes on too. And uh, as you look, maybe look through your environment that you have, um, where you're currently at and see, are there certain processes in place that prevents, uh, or that could not prevent, but that could enable someone to gain access to an unsecured location? You know, for instance, if I came to your location right now, would I be able to get in without somebody testing me, without somebody asking me for ID? Do I have to have a badge? Right? Will I be able to get into some room that's labeled server room because you made it easy for me to find it? Can I go into your bathroom and do like we did in the breakfast club? Go in through the drop ceiling and then get into your server room that way. Am I able to do that? And you betcha we're going to try that out if we're in your buildings. right? If we have permission to come in and test that, we will try that route. And if we're able to do it, guess what? Then we will suggest to say, well, you need to have a firewall uh, around your entire server room. And uh, not a firewall as we would traditionally uh, talk about, but more like you know, the, the drywall needs to go all the way up to, to the roof, basically, and it needs to be double protected, and that's called a firewall and, uh, and such. And those types of things is what we will basically do. And again, um, this is what's, again, really nice and uh, that, that I like about the job because not only do I teach about these things, I go out there and do it as well, and Mile 2 gives the opportunity for that. And uh, again, I'm, I'm very proud to be part of the team here, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're excited to have me on board as well. And again, we're just a good team environment. Individually, yeah, you know, we do so well, but as a team, we do really well. So anyway, uh, I know I'm kind of almost out of time here, 
we're going to kind of leave it off right here at this honeypot scenario. And uh, what I'll do here is I'll open things up for you guys to see if you had any questions regarding uh, some of the things we've covered here regarding the CISSO, uh, Chapter 5, Chapter 6, and, uh, and so forth. And um, feel free if you, um, again, if, if, if questions come up after the fact, uh, feel free to, to check out the, uh, the, the archive uh, or the, the, where, you go, <laughs> where you guys go to uh, ask the questions and feel free to ask those. And then um, either myself or one of our instructors will uh, assist you with uh, answering those uh, questions and so forth. All right. Other than that, uh, I, I do appreciate you guys uh, coming in and checking it out. Uh, hopefully it was exciting and eye-opening. Uh, just remember, we learned about scotomas today, so I guess the letter of the day was S, as in scotoma. <laughs> and uh, just remember, that it was just called a blind spot, and we all have them. And hopefully, with this session that we've done, we did some pretty good scotoma busting, and hopefully got rid of some of those blind spots we may have had uh, prior. Again, I appreciate you guys uh, sticking it through. We'll be uh, around for another few minutes, so if you have any questions, ask those right now or uh, pop them up on the site uh, and uh, ask those away as well. All right, thanks again. Other than that, you guys are dismissed, and thank you very much for joining us today on Friday the 13th, Mile 2 and the State of Texas. <laughs>